Um, I wanted to take this time and kind of do a little bit of a special um, take an opportunity uh, of Nate being in town. Uh, we'll see. I mean, I saw, I noticed on Facebook, like everybody apparently is on vacation and out of town this week. Um, but I told Nate I would like to get together and, uh, and us discuss and kind of catch up uh, a little bit with everybody. And so let me open in prayer. I'm going to pray kind of general prayer request uh, for everybody. Open in prayer. And then we got about, um, you know, a few minutes here. Um, for Nate and I to talk that long is not difficult. So I've got a few minutes here just to talk about the Lord, about the church, about Imago Day, what's going on in Raleigh, about church planning. Um, and even I wanted to get an update on the, the, the Southern Baptist Convention that Nate was, uh, attended that we weren't able to go to. So just a number of things I wanted, thought it would be helpful for us to kind of discuss and catch up on. And for those of you who don't know Nate, it's a Nate, Nate Aiken, uh, pastor of disciple making at Imago Day in Raleigh, the church where I spent 10 months training uh, before I came to Freedom um, three and a half, almost four years ago. So I uh, wanted, to, wanted to have some interaction over what God's doing there uh, and then in his heart. So let's, let's open in prayer and we'll get started. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather even on this Independence Day. Uh, we thank you for the freedom that we can gather publicly uh, and proclaim the good news of the gospel to worship, uh, to sing praise, to sit under the preaching of your word, to fellowship together around your word, to pray your word and sing your word, uh, and then live out the community uh, that your word creates. And so we just praise you for that freedom. We pray you bless this time uh, <clears throat> during this Sunday school time uh, and make it edifying, encouraging to us. May it give us vision for faithfulness to you, your kingdom, your church, your mission. And, uh, and may we be spurred on to love and good deeds. We pray for Imago Day this morning as well uh, as they gather to worship. Uh, we pray you bless their services, uh, that the gospel would make clear uh, that unbelievers would hear, repent, and believe and, and have life in your name. Uh, that the church would be edified and built up, and that the gospel mission would advance even through their worship this morning as well. And so we pray, bless this time for your glory, for your name's sake, for our good in you, and for the advancement of your gospel. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> um, all right, with Nate, we, we, Nate came in town Friday night, or Friday, and we spent some time together uh, and excited to catch up. Nate is a really, really good friend uh, to me. We, we've had uh, plenty of good, fun, theological arguments and fights since he's been here. Uh, so we love the Bible. We love to have good, good dialogue. Uh, one of the things I appreciate most about Nate, and you guys will hear in the sermon this morning um, <clears throat> as, as he addresses it there, uh, but want to start um, getting a little bit of kind of his background. But one of the things I appreciate most about Nate is his passion and love for the church, for the bride of Christ. And so, um, so I wanted to start this morning, Nate, uh, give us a quick maybe background, uh, you know, brief version of when you came to faith yeah. and maybe just your, your story growing up. But then tell us why you're so passionate about the church. Yeah. So I, I think I, I became a Christian early, around eight or nine. Um, my, my dad's a pastor. In fact, he's preached here, he's preached here before. So I uh, grew up in a, in a really faithful family, and so I heard the gospel many times as a child. And I think that I felt finally conviction of sin around eight or nine. Went to my dad and essentially asked, what must I do to be saved? How do, you know, I had this, this feeling of this weight that I can't uh, deal with. And so he talked, us, he talked me through it, and then I got baptized probably about a year or two later. At that point, we were kind of slow in walking through baptism. Um, so that's been my story. Now, the reason, and I'll get to some of this, and you, if you have clarifying questions you want to ask. Um, I had a time of pretty serious rebellion, um, mainly second year of college into my probably first year of being a young professional. Um, it wasn't always constant um, rebellion, but it was kind of like hills and valleys. Um, many things I could say about that. One, and I'll even talk about this some today in, in the sermon that I'll, that I'll preach, is that I actually think that during that time I should have had no confidence that I was actually a Christian. Uh, I think I was a Christian, so I think about Hebrews 12 when he talks about God disciplining the son that he loves mm. and bringing me back. There was a time of a pretty, pretty harsh discipline where he, he brought me back, and then from then has been uh, constant growth, and then now serving, being able to serve the Lord in full-time pastoral ministry. So, um, so in college, and, and what, what essentially I had said to myself, so I, I was in Louisville, Kentucky in high school. Uh, I was going to go off to Murray, Kentucky, which was three hours away to play college basketball. Um, most of y'all probably don't know who Murray State is, but it is actually a Division I basketball school. So it's a small town, a lot like Lincolnton, except for it has a university, uh, Murray State University. And so the town basically, in many ways, revolves around this university. And the university's always had a really good basketball team. So in many ways, like we're treated very, very special in the town. Like, like literally, if I walked into a restaurant, people paid for our meals, those kind of things. So they knew people, especially now, it's like the, there's three white guys on the team. So I would have stood <laughs> out even more. Um, 
And so Talk I about thought, just, just for uh, entertainment value, yeah. your claim to fame in the midst of that is, is my probably the best thing I ever did in college. Maybe basketball. Two claim to fame. Yeah, I'll give you two. The best thing I ever did in college basketball was in an NCAA tournament game. I fouled Illinois' Deron Williams, who is an NBA player now. So my best thing I ever did was I fouled a guy. Um, and then if y'all have ever seen the show Around the Horn, so there's a, there's a, a sports show, it's a talk show where there's four guys giving answers and the, and the main guy's giving them points for how well he thinks they're doing. Uh, before we played Illinois in the NCAA tournament, we were a 12 seed, Illinois was a five seed. Since the tournament started, the, a 12 seed has always beaten a five seed. So they're asking the four guys, uh, which of these 12 seeds is gonna win? And Woody Page, the guy who I like the most, picked Murray State to beat Illinois. Uh, he didn't know that our best player got arrested on Selection Sunday and got kicked off the team. That hurt, that hurt us quite a bit. Um, so I emailed him and said, hey, we love the show. I found his email on his, where he wrote, the newspaper he wrote for. Hey, we love the show, big fans, thanks for picking us. And the next day when he won the show, he mentioned me and my roommate's name on TV. And so on ESPN, on Around the Horn, which was really cool. So uh, the best thing I did in college basketball was foul a guy and write an email. So that, that's... <laughs> That was, the height. Superstar. That, was, Superstar. Yeah, that was the height of my college basketball career. <clears throat> uh, I thought when I went to Murray, uh, I, I did kind of have this idea that I wanted to dabble a little bit in, in the, the lifestyle of an athlete. Um, but I kind of had this idea, I can go it alone and be a Christian. I don't have to surround myself. In high school, I had really solid Christian friends and a solid church. And I kind of thought, I can go off to school, I can kind of do my own thing, and I can still have my relationship with God. Um, which was completely false, um, completely false, which is why uh, you'll even hear my passion about it t today in the sermon, um, but is why I'm so passionate about the church. I, I realized that even though I'd grown up in a really good home, um, I didn't understand the significance or the importance of the local church. So you kind of always thought of the local church as something that you do, something that you go to, and I just go to for an hour a week on Sunday and maybe an hour on Wednesday. And it, it sort of was like a Christian club to me, like a social club where people had similar interests to me. We went and hung out, and that was about it. It didn't really seem to have effect on the rest of the week. Um, and so I just, I felt like I really misunderstood the church. When God, in his grace, really turned me around, one of the things he did to really, um, to, to, to really kind of bring growth in my life was to, to really show me from the scriptures how important the local church was. And, and so because of the heartache I had experienced in college, uh, and then because of reading the scriptures, I became, became very uh, passionate and convictional about the importance of the local church, the need that we all have for the local church. What, what I've seen, and y'all probably have stories like this, is that when you have poor local churches, it really damages Christian faith. Um, and it's really painful and harmful. And that we need to build healthy churches for the good of God's people. And so I've just become very, very passionate about that. Yeah, so I, you've, you've, you've mentioned to me before, but um, you don't have to get into detail. Mm -hmm. But I do remember... For you, even, so when we talk about the church, um, we've talked about it here consistently in our membership class. We, we preach the book of Matthew. We talk about church discipline. We talk yep. about it in Titus, even uh, last week, the nature of yeah. uh, discipline in the church, mm -hmm. that a healthy church comes after us, will discipline us if, if yeah. we run away. Uh, so I know you mentioned during that season of college, yeah. a longing for understanding some of that. So you talk Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, again, um, two things I would say. One, I probably should have had no confidence that I was a Christian. And I think uh, the Bible's clear. Like, you don't love the brothers. Um, you don't walk according to, to my commandments. Um, several things. It's clear. It seems like you should have no confidence that you're actually a believer. Um, so that's one thing. And, and so I would say, though, uh, though so I, what I would say then is that I wished a church would have actually followed through with what it was called to follow through with based upon passages like Matthew 18, 1 Corinthians 5, that they would have pursued me for discipline and called me back to repentance. Because I actually believe that if they had, uh, I would have repented. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to say clearly, I was responsible for everything I was doing. I, had, I knew better, and I chose differently. Mm -hmm. um, so by saying that, I'm not trying to put the blame. I think it's easy when we get hurt by a church to then put the blame for our failings on the church. Uh, and I do think the church can be culpable at times, but I do think I was responsible. Having said that, I think if the church had followed through in obedience with what it was supposed to follow through with, I, I do think I would have turned into repentance, and I think it would have spared me years of heartache. Mm -hmm. And so that's why not only am I passionate about the church, I'm passionate about what the church is called to do in the world. And I, call, I think the, the call for church discipline, and we try to explain this in our membership class, is not a call to actually punitive punishment. It's a call to love, to restore that person. And so I just see the necessity of that. And it's, a lot of it's bore out of my own experience, but it's obviously written about in, in, the, in the book. So, yeah. Um, 
So we'll talk a little more about that in a minute as well. But I would love even, so you talk about some of the growing up um, and your experience. So I'd love, you know, a little bit about how many siblings, a little yeah. bit of your family culture growing yeah. up. Um, yeah, just, yeah, just some of the fun dynamics. So there. yeah, so I have three brothers. I have a twin brother who's three minutes younger than me, and I remind him of that regularly. Um, so I'm the oldest. And uh, so twin brother and then two younger brothers. We're all within four and a half years apart. And so four brothers grew up essentially together. Um, we love sports, so, um, you know, my dad loves sports. We grew up loving sports, and uh, I'll even say this in the sermon. I, I thought I was going to be the first ever professional baseball, basketball, and football player. Um, <laughs> I was sadly mistaken. Um, but so, so grew up in a family of, of boys, my poor mom, uh, but lots of sports. And, and even now, though, so, like, all of my brothers are walking with the Lord. And in fact, all of my brothers are in pastoral ministry. Uh, my twin brother pastors in Nashville, Tennessee, or right outside Nashville. Uh, my middle brother, he was pastoring in Birmingham, but he's gone now with David Platt to be uh, his aide at the IMB International Mission Board. And so he's in Richmond now. And then my youngest brother is uh, suffering for the Lord, pastoring in West Palm Beach, Florida, <laughs> um, really struggling down there. So, um, so they're all serving the Lord. So now, I, I mean, our dynamic is really fun. We're, we're still really close. Our family's really close. We just got back from vacation a week, not last week, but the week before at the beach where we got to watch the NBA finals together, which we don't get to watch sports together anymore. So that was really fun. There was a lot of argument about who was better, Cleveland or Golden State, and I ended up being right. And, uh, and then there was a lot of theological arguments as well. So now Ed, that we Eddie are, wants you to elaborate on yeah, LeBron. Back yeah. Then. Well, I mean, it's clear. It's, it, I mean, top, he, he led in every statistical category. It's not even a question. But um, right, take notes, Eddie. And then, and then we would have theological disagreements as well, where we would we would try to sharpen one another. And so that's what our time is like. And it feels like we almost never solve or even end any conversation because we're kind of ADD. So it goes from one thing to the next. And there's never a resolution to any of the arguments or any of the conversations, uh, but we have a great time together. So by God's grace, I mean, still really close. I have a lot of fun together. I think sure. I, I'll bring that out. We talked about this when Dr. Aikman was here a year ago. Um, but one of the things, kind of he said his general advice for parenting, um, and I think this was really a relief to me, you know, as you're trying to parent your kids and, or be grandparents to, to grandkids or good siblings or aunts and uncles uh, or just even friends to families. And uh, he basically said, Look, talk about Jesus like normal people and have fun. Yeah. That's my general parenting advice. And, uh, and so just seeing the fruitfulness of, of their family, that there wasn't, you know, kind of this super spiritual. Yeah. He like, didn't, so he didn't like, I mean, he didn't make us do catechisms. I mean, they would teach us the Bible at, at dinner. They would, he would read us to us stories when we go to bed. He'd pray with us at our bedside. But it wasn't like this strict regiment. So we would even, we'd even miss some nights. Um, he would read to us the, things like the Chronicles of Narnia as well, other kind of Christian literature. Um, but it was never, so I've heard of a guy named A.T. Robertson who was a, just a famous Greek scholar. He taught at Southern Seminary in the early 1900s. All four of his kids went apostate, uh, and he was like incredibly legalistic and strict with them. Like they would have to go in their room on Sundays after service, and they would have to write out the Bible for six hours, things like that. And, uh, and they all walked away. And um, I just think you can go quite overboard on some of those things. And my dad, just, he, didn't, he didn't do that. And so... He did teach us about Jesus. He taught us to love Jesus and, and what sin was and to be obedient. Uh, I could tell stories about his discipline. But we loved our dad and my mom, and we had fun, and they taught us to love Jesus. Yeah. All right, so, why don't, <clears throat> so that's kind of Nate. Again, I want you all to get a little feel of him. Um, one of the things we, we've joked about when his dad was here. So Dr. Aiken's the president of Southeastern, um, and, and he's a big deal in some circles. But what's fun is he's so humble and normal. I wanted you all to get a little feel of that. So when he was here last May... <clears throat> So he loves sports. Um, he stayed at our house with us. So we, he didn't make us put, us up, put him up in some hotel or whatever. He stayed at the house with us. And we came in uh, after the service on Saturday night. So we did a, an event Saturday night and then Sunday morning. And we came into our house. And he was on the couch watching the NBA Finals. And he was kind of slumped over on the couch watching the Finals. And Nias at that time had what he called his mank mank, which was his little blanket he slept with. It was about this big. And Danny was covered up with this <laughs> blanket. <laughs> so I walk in and kind of look. And I'm like... <laughs> Uh, can I get you like a real blanket? Like, he's like, no, nah, this is good. Just turn the game up. <laughs> so anyway, I just love their fam family dynamic. I love that you get around the Aikens and they immediately feel like family. It's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about Southeastern uh, is, and that culture is there. It's a great place to learn, mm -hmm. grow. So transitioning from the Aikens and, and your story specifically, tell us a little bit about Imago Day. Um, so assume nobody knows anything. Yeah. 
Give us a story of Imago Day. Start with kind of the plant, when it started, you guys coming yeah. together, jobs, and then get us to kind of mission and what you're doing. This yeah, so we're almost five years old, which is amazing. In some senses, it seems like it was yesterday, and in some senses, it seems like 10 years ago. It's crazy. Uh, I got to know Tony, who's our lead teaching pastor, through some other events, conferences, things like that. We connected, I mean, really got along. And then he was desiring to come plant a church. And I had always, I've been at a church in Raleigh that did a lot of church planting. Uh, I had desired to do church planting, but I always felt like as a single man, I didn't want to be the lead pastor. Uh, I, w I would rather just be on a team, though I did have desires to preach and other things. So I met Tony. Tony was like, what do you desire to do? I was like, I love membership, small groups. He's like, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, would you consider this? So I, t I went back to my elders and said, hey, you know, this opportunity has presented itself. I, I feel passionate about it, but I want to hear do y'all think I'm qualified? Do you think it's a good thing for me? Those kind of things. And to which they said, yes, you think you need to pursue it. And at that point, I decided I, I was going to join the team. Tony was living in Mississippi at the time, pastoring a, a large church, about 3,000 people. So it was amazing that he was leaving a very nice church and probably, a, I mean, I don't know, but probably a nice salary to come plant a church to have no salary. Um, my dad did initially tell him, if you come to Raleigh to plant a church, you can teach preaching at Southeastern. So he starts to come up, I join the team, and then there's one guy at Imago Day that I had known who was a little older than me, who had gone through our training with me, and uh, I always just remember thinking, this guy's awesome, uh, he's gifted in every way I'm not, administratively gifted, all that. I was like, if I ever plant a church, I want that guy to plant a church with me. And his name was Matt Sigmund, so I asked him to join the team, and he He's prayed. an older version of Sug. Yeah, so that's what you should know. Yeah, he's administratively gifted where Tony and I... If it was left to us, we probably wouldn't even make bill pay. You know, it's just horrible. Um, and so he joined the team. And so we started meeting. At, Tony moved up in May of 2011, so five years ago. And we started meeting in Tony's home. Uh, we, we had a small team of a small group team of 17 adults. And we started doing develop, like core team development. So teaching doctrine, teaching practice, the things we wanted to be about, what our mission wanted to be. Um, and so we, we did that through the summer. We, in fact, at that time, which I don't always recommend for church plants, we wouldn't invite people to join us because we were afraid if we just kind of opened it up, we'd get a lot of seminary students and we were trying to, to not do that. So Tony brought up seven adults from Mississippi. And then we brought over about seven more, about 10 more in Raleigh. So there's 17 and we met for about two or three months and then started to invite people in, started to get too big for a house. And so we decided, well, let's start meeting publicly. Um, we did our first public meeting that was open to everybody September 11th, 2011. So our five-year anniversary will be seven, September 11th, 2016, which is coming up. And so that's kind of the, the backstory on that. We want to be passionate about expository preaching. We want to be passionate about community. So a real push for small groups, passionate about meaningful membership, and then passionate about church planting and mercy ministry. So those are kind of the things that we were like, if you ask people at Mago Day, what are y'all about? Like those would basically be the things this is what we're about. Uh, and so what we've tried to commit ourselves to is what we call the peace plan. So to, to plant, so peace, and then the acronym plant churches. So we have by God's grace uh, been able to plant five churches in the process of, of two more at this point. Um, so they've been in places like Cary, which is right outside of Raleigh. So local, we sent 25 to 30 there. Philadelphia, um, which y'all met Brian Davis. Some of y'all met Brian Davis. So we, he was with Imago Day for a year and then sent him to Philly. Uh, we planted in Denver, Colorado, Atlanta, Georgia. Those are both kind of in the initial stages of the core teams developing uh, and things like that. And then we planted in Hampton Road, Virginia. And then we've got designs, hopefully, to plant in Salt Lake City and in Durham, and then even possibly Charlotte in the, in the years, to, years ahead. So some of those are still in planning phase. So plant churches, then evangelize the world is the E. Uh, by God's grace, and probably because of our connection to the seminary, we've been able to send out 17 international missionaries um, all over the world. Mainly, most of them have, have gone to uh, South Asia, so kind of India area. Uh, we actually have uh, a young man who's in... Bangladesh and um, was very close to the attack that happened on Friday night. Uh, he's, he's fine, but he's struggling. Mm -hmm. um, and so be praying for him. He's had a rough time. The first week he got there, an American was killed within a mile of where he lived. Um, so it's been really rough for him and um, he's in a tough place. So yeah, by God's grace, we've been able to be committed to international missions. Uh, a and C are aid the poor and sick and care for the orphan and the oppressed. So we wanted to be from the beginning those that did mercy ministry. So we have a, you know, an adoption fund. We work with orphans. Uh, we work with the homeless in the city. I mean, several mercy ministries that are, that are going on all the time. 
um, First Choice, which is a, a pregnancy crisis center. We, we spend a lot of time helping them. Um, so just several things like that. And then finally, Equip Leaders is the final piece where we want to be a church that, that multiplies ourselves by equipping pastors, guys like Clint and others, to send them out to either pastor churches like Freedom or plant churches like we're sending out. And so that's kind of our mission and vision. And by God's grace, he's, he's allowed us to be, you know, we've now had to go through Aspire, which is our intern training. So we, I was going to ask you, yeah. go ahead and talk about Aspire, what that yeah. is. Dr. This is our equipping it. leaders. What we do is the elders meet once a week for about an hour and a half with the guys we invite into this group. We're trying to keep it somewhere at between 10 and 15. At one point we had like 25 and it's just, you weren't, we weren't able to have the same kind of interaction. So we invite these guys in one, one and a half hours a week. What we do is we teach them through the pastoral epistles. So we teach them what it looks like to be a pastor. And then we go through three main top topics. We go through pastoral ministry. What is the call and role of a pastor? We go through ecclesiology. What is, what is the theology of the church? So, like, if you're going to pastor a church, what are you supposed to be pastoring? Um, which, sadly, even when guys go out to plant churches, they don't study ecclesiology. It's like, you don't even know what you're going to plant. But that, I could go on that soapbox. And then, finally, mission or, or evangelism. So, being about multiplying yourself. And so, we take them through the pastoral epistles, and then we take them through books that we think are pro, you know, prevalent in those, those three categories. And then we make them write position papers on topics like divorce and remarriage and things you're going to face as a pastor, uh, like you're going to face immediately as a pastor. And so they write, write those things. And so we spend a year and a half with them, watching them, uh, spending you know, one-on-one time and as well as, as class time with them. Yeah. So that the, my f- I did the internship at Imago Day. I did the first. I was only at Imago Day for ten months. So what's interesting is in my own kind of spiritual development, um, my, my father led me to faith early age, uh, but I really started to grow in college with Camp Savage College Ministry. Went on staff with CO, was discipled and worked with them for for seven years, and then ended up at Imago Day for only ten months. And so um, I would say most of my theology and, and, and view of evangelism, discipleship, the Lord Jesus, and, and the Bible was developed through my father and then through CO. Um, but what those 10 months at Imago did, did was teach me, now, how do you live this out in the local church? Because I didn't, I didn't have good experiences growing up in the local church. So we didn't, you know, we went to a couple, had some really bad experiences, and so we just didn't go. And so at Imago Day, I, I, for me, it was like, oh, my goodness, this is everything I've been taught kind of in the CO realm, but how to do it in the local church. Um, so only being there for 10 months. Then you guys called me in January of 12, right? Yeah, of 12. Um, but I went from Raleigh, to, uh, from Raleigh to Lincolnton every other weekend from January to April um, because of the house situation or whatever and finished that semester. So Luke and I, um, <clears throat> in that, so we were laughing the other day. So Luke and I would get up at 4 a.m. or leave Lincolnton at 4 a.m. Uh, to drive to Raleigh to get there for, the, for a Spire internship at 7.30 in the morning. Uh, go to the, the class, then go to chapel, take another class, and get home about 7 o'clock at night. So it was a 4 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, evening, and, uh, and that first semester was, was, uh, <laughs> was a challenge, to say the least. No but, but finished up with them and, uh, and love that. So now so there's a couple things I want to do. In, um, so we're now doing that same thing. So the exact same material, the exact same uh, syllabi that are used for that class through Southeastern to give seminary credit to guys. So Daka Flaka, Michael was over there, uh, Dr. White, uh, is able through Southeastern, we're able to partner with Southeastern and then do that and offer that at, well, we do it at the coffee shop at Fausto. Um, so in the spring we started, the first semester we had, we had um, Jeremy Mahaffey from Mount Vernon coming and getting seminary credit. Uh, so he's already a senior pastor, but was coming. William Montgomery from Macedonia Missionary Baptist Church was coming and being a part of that. Uh, Josh is taking it for credit as well. Uh, and then Brent, um, I don't know if Brent's in here. There we go. Brent Chapman will start in the fall doing that some too. And so a way for us to now, what we saw, what I was getting there, I mean, how can we do that in this context and begin to equip local pastors that are currently serving uh, that maybe couldn't go off to seminary, working by vocation or whatever, how can we equip and encourage other churches, uh, but also, Lord willing, interns and, and uh, be able to plant and send guys out too. So I wanted you guys to see and, and hear a, a little bit uh, about some of that. Um, so talk about, I would say, talk about... Um, Maybe give us the roles, because um, I think everybody here has pretty much gotten used to me, Michael, and Josh, some of those dynamics, but I would love to hear kind of your, um, what are your, your staff pastors, how many lay elders you have, how big is the church now, yeah. how do you guys do some shepherding in small groups, yeah. some of those kind of things. So we have 11 elders now, four staff elders, seven lay elders, um, and we're always trying to add lay elders. Uh, I'll just give you the, the responsibilities of the staff elders. So Tony is lead, lead in preaching and vision. So. Tony is mainly, uh, though we, it's a very team driven thing. So even the stuff I'll talk about in a minute for me, what, that are my responsibilities, I'm always asking for advice, thoughts, 
a lot of pushback. So Tony, even with what we're going to preach through, asked for, um, asked for a lot of thought. So Tony mainly is, is over what we're going to be preaching from the pulpit and then what's our long-term vision for what we want to do. Uh, I'm over discipleship, which is small groups, uh, membership, our leadership development that I just talked about. And then I preach about once a month, so about 12 times a year. And then, uh, then we have Matt Sigman, who's our executive pastor, administrative pastor. So he's over like basically everything else, it seems like. Uh, so membership roles, uh, counseling, um, handling finances, all that stuff that goes into being able to make the, the church actually run and not fall apart. Mm-hmm. And then Donnie is over what we call corporate worship. But, so he leads us musically, but he doesn't just lead us musically. He crafts the whole liturgy of the service. So what the, the whole order of the service is going to be on Sunday. Donnie crafts that other than the sermon, but basically crafts what it's going to look like. He does a very good job of making sure the songs connect to the sermon, uh, the text that we'll read connects to the sermon, all those things. So he oversees that, and he also does some counseling as well. So uh, Donnie's going to have those, those responsibilities. So e- even stuff like audio video, Donnie oversees for our corporate worship. The lay elders uh, mainly have shepherding responsibility. All the elders do. So what, the way we break it down is each uh, leader at Imago Day, each pastor or elder, has three small groups, three to four small groups that are under them that provide the primary shepherding care for them. So we'd be the first line of counseling, first line of rebuke if necessary. But we're like going to those small groups, we're getting to know those people so that our people are known. Uh, and so that's what mainly, the, that's really mostly what the lay elders do, though they speak into large picture issues. So if, we, if we're going to hopefully find a building to buy at some point, they would have to be an affirmation of that, that, that kind of thing. So they speak into that. Um, we've now grown over five years to our attendance is right around 775, 750 to 775 on any given Sunday. We're having to run three services. We got a room that's smaller than this one. And so we're running three services, 9, 11, and 5, which is awful. Um, and we were, having to, we're thinking about having to go to a fourth, so we're hoping to find some property or, or find a building that would fit us at some point. Um, and so we only have about 450 members. So of that 775, 450 are members. We've got a pretty extensive membership process, much like y'all have here. Um, so 450 members, uh, pff, I don't know, 42 small groups, something like that. Um, it's hard to keep up with now. It's really, I mean, that's part of my job to assimilate, and it gets, it gets really difficult. If you don't know how many there are. I, mean, I don't know you, how many there you, are. You, I mean, I can, go, I can go count them. I've got a list. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so there, was there something else to the question that I missed? So, um, so I would say just the plurality. So, so Tony, yeah. uh, just so you all know, um, again, those 10 months there for me was the first time ever I'd sit under what we would call expository preaching, preaching through books of the Bible and just explaining what the Bible says. And... Um, and it's the first time I've ever seen that. And I would say week in, week out, best preacher ever set under. Very humble, oh, common guy. And what, even how he modeled it was there's nothing um, necessarily unique. It's, it's just hard work. You've got to go through and study all of it. And, and, uh, and so he constantly would use, you know, like a farmer or whatever. You've got to sweat. You've got to get through it, figure it out, and teach it. So, so extru- but he's, um, I would say there's that principle. Then he's really, really gifted. Um, yeah. Yet, he only preaches 30, 35 times a year. Yeah. All of you guys were by vocation at the beginning. Yeah. So I would say just talk about why. All, yeah. like, again, everybody here would, would buy into plurality, but I'd I just like for them to hear another church and why you guys yeah. do some of, the, some of the same things. Yeah, so one, we're just convinced that it's, it's, in, it's in the Bible. Um, and I'm not even convinced, though I'm not, I'm not mad at people who do this, I'm not even convinced of the senior pastor. I don't see that anywhere in the New Testament. What you see uh, constantly is elders. So... Even Paul goes and plants the churches, the first churches, and it says when he's going back through, he appoints elders in each church. Um, and then you got all kinds of things. Even in James, when it's talking about praying over the sick person, it says, call for the elders of the church to come pray over. And so one of the things that we try to do is just say, okay, this, like, we are all 11 of us are your pastor. So like, for instance, in, in churches I grew up in, if I was sick and in the hospital and the guy that did mainly the teaching didn't come visit me in the hospital, my pastor didn't come see me in the hospital. What we're trying to say is if one of the 11 of us come, your pastor came to see you in the hospital. And then in some senses, we have equal authority as far as decision-making in the church. So it's not like Tony makes decisions and we just follow. We actually have equal authority. In fact, Tony would joke early on that Matt and I would make way more decisions than he made, uh, which was probably true because Tony was kind of like, well, if y'all want to do that, that's fine. Um, and so uh, there is a true plurality to what we do. Now, there is a sense in which I've got more responsibility when it comes to membership and Tony's got more responsibility when it comes to preaching and he'll make more decisions, but we all speak into all those things. And so trying to have a true, true plurality because we think it's, it's biblical, but also think it's practical. That's the reason I think it's biblical because I've just seen even in the guys, some of the guys we've sent out to plant churches, when you try to go it alone, you have to bear the burden of mm-hmm. being a pastor. So Hebrews 13 talks about that someday we're going to give an account for your soul, that we give an account for how we've cared for you. 
to bear that burden on your shoulder alone is almost unbearable. And it's really, it's like really chewed pastors up and spit them out. Um, and so the call is for a group of men to give an account for this body. And so I just think it's very practical. It, it, makes, it makes pastoring more fun. It makes it, I mean, it's still stressful, but it makes it less stressful. It uh, makes it more um, able to be, to be, you know, to bear it. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons we're so passionate about it. One of the things uh, we've been discussing recently and, and uh, just encouraged, um, so I want to give a couple disclaimers before I say this so you guys don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Disclaimer, uh, freedom, again, we're more about the kingdom of God than we are Freedom Church. So we want other churches in our area to flourish. That's why we pray for other churches consistently by name, uh, even on Sunday mornings. That's why we're building these relationships with, again, uh, you know, Jeremy Mahaffey at Mount Vernon or William. Uh, we, want to see other, we want to see the gospel flourish, not just Freedom Church for us, the gospel in all churches that are they're being faithful to the gospel. But one of the things that seems unique, so in small town USA, thinking through how do we plant churches, how do we, how do, we do some of these principles that we see in the scriptures, one of the things I've been encouraged by um, discouraged on one level but encouraged by another level uh, is that we have a number and there's no need to, to call out particular names or whatever but we have a number of pastors who have been burned in some similar senior pastor all the pressure on one guy worn him out worn his family out and kind of left wounded who's ended up here um, and so I'm I'm thinking right now there's at least five who at some point were either associate or senior pastors kind of in that in that vein that, that are usually here on Sunday mornings uh, but one of the things we're excited about is, and what if the Lord has, in freedom's history and kind of who we are as a church, and most of you guys have been through that kind of pain, um, that God has a unique ministry for this church to minister to those who are hurting coming out of those scenarios. Again, we're not trying to bash any other churches, but minister to those coming out of those scenarios. But then, particularly some of these pastors, equip them with, this is how you can do plurality and healthy church. And then, may, who knows, maybe Lord willing, there's seasons where some of those pastors are here just as members or working other jobs. Uh, but that as some of the other churches die off or getting unhealthy, they say, could you guys help us? Could you guys send a pastor to us now that, that is ready to help us? And that's a way that even maybe in small town world is a way to do church planning. Um, that churches get down to 20, 25 people. They reach out to Freedom and say, hey, I know you guys got several pastors over there. Can you do anything to help us? And that's a way that, so we may not necessarily plant churches in Atlanta and Denver and some of these other places we may, and we're partnering and helping some of those. We've got Brian in Philly and, and helping with him. Uh, but then ways that we can even do that locally and encouraging uh, uh, pastors and churches around here. So really excited about kind of seeing Freedom continue to have that kind of ministry. Um, so Nate, we've got, you know, five to seven minutes. Any closing, just exhortations or encouragements or anything else about the church or mission anything else you'd want to say to us before we before we wrap up in, in prayer here yeah i don't know if it'll go five to seven minutes so you could fill in the rest um <laughs> you have no problem talking but um <laughs> i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> my sermon's gonna be shorter today than clint's normally are um I'll just say i told that. him i told him no he was like hey when i preached this at Maga day it was 34 minutes i said if you preach 34 minutes scott Wilms is gonna come up to you and say that was a nice little devotional <laughs> I added some things just for Scott. Um, <laughs> yeah, so my encouragement would be, I, I mean, and I'm going to say this as well at the beginning of the sermon that I've just here. So one, I can just see the evidences of grace here at this church in simple things like it looks nicer than the last time I was here. So that's that's cool. Um, it, it's, it looks really good, I think. And, uh, and so that, but then also that y'all have grown numerically and then also grown in depth. Uh, I mean, I, I talk to Clint often and then he shares encouraging stories about... Uh, you know, stronger marriages and, you know, people walking with the Lord and just, he speaks high, like I meet, you know, met a guy yesterday, Clint and I were touring the building and he just talked about how you know, wonderful this guy is. So I hear stories all the time about how you guys are growing in God's grace. And I think that's just something to celebrate. Like one of the things, CJ Mahaney is a pastor who's, who's come to preach and he just talks to us all, all the time about trying to identify evidences of grace. It'll make you a joyful people. Mm. And I just think y'all need to just celebrate and be encouraged by there are evidences of grace in this congregation uh, that weren't here necessarily five, six years ago or whatever, but they're here and you should, you should just you know, thank the Lord, praise the Lord to see those kind of evidences of grace. And then just as the elders are trying to lead you guys into some of these things we're talking about as far as healthy church to embrace those things. I mean, you are called to be Bereans though, so I, I, you study the scriptures. If they bring something to you that's not biblical, I mean, you're to reject that, you know? Uh, but you're called to honor your pastors. I, don't, I think you have really good pastors, so I don't think they're going to bring anything to you that is unbiblical. But as they do, as they teach you things from the Bible about what the church looks like, embrace those things. And even if it hasn't been your experience. So there may be, you know, I never really experienced plurality of elders. 
Uh, and I had a little bit of, of kind of reaction against it when I was growing, growing up and when I first started to hear about it. And now that I've become convinced that it's biblical by some good teaching and now experience it, I see why the Bible has that for us. And so as you hear those things, just embrace them, celebrate them, and continue to have this healthy church so that, I mean, think about this. This, this thing that Clint just talked about as far as maybe pastors coming here and then being able to be sent out to other places, your, your, your influence will go far beyond Lincoln to North Carolina because of the way you guys are doing things right now. So just don't even minimize things like when I give money for the good of the church, things are going to happen that influence outside of Lincoln to North Carolina. And that's an incredible thing, even if you never see it with your eyes. And so just know, see with eyes of faith, what's happening here is going to be for the good of the surrounding areas and probably even areas that are far from here. And so you want to celebrate that and really embrace that and praise the Lord to be able to be a part of that. Amen. Amen. Any, um, so we can maybe take one or two questions. Any quick questions for Nate? Otherwise, I'll close in prayer. But any, any questions from anything you said, or Scott, any uh, charges of heresy or anything you'd like to? <laughs> Did I see one? Come on the bed. Which question? You guys speak loudly. What's Berean? Yeah, so Berean is, there's a text in Acts where Paul praises the church at, in Berea. So the, the Bereans are the church in Berea because they test what is said by the word of God. And so when I say, that's, that's a good question. I sometimes feel like I'm speaking in a seminary class. I apologize about that. But so th that's who they are. And he, they were praised for the fact that they knew the word and they would test what they heard by the word. So it's a good question. Great. Anything else? Well, Nate, brother, thanks for sharing. Yeah. Uh, I'd love Great. to close in prayer for Imago Day and just for the service yeah. this morning. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for, even as Nate was mentioning, evidences of grace uh, in this church. Uh, we all proclaim you are the hero, you are the king. Uh, you are the one, Holy Spirit, who's done the work to produce these evidences of grace to teach us about the Lord Jesus uh, and his bride and how to be faithful. We thank you for the same at, at, uh, at Imago Day that you're doing good work there, that you're uh, using them to uh, train even the guys that are, uh, many of the guys that are at Southeastern in training and launch them and send them out to, to do other churches very similar to this one. Uh, we pray uh, specifically even right now for Skylar. Um, Who's, who's planting in Denver and the work, even as the elders here are, are hearing about that work and considering uh, would that be something we'd financially support uh, in the future. And, and so we do pray for them as they're, as they're doing work in a very difficult and dark city. Uh, for the gospel, we pray for uh, Nate. And uh, this morning as he preaches the word, Spirit, would you uh, empower him uh, to bring to bear the truths of your word uh, in our hearts. May we repent and believe. Uh, may we trust and rest uh, in the finished work of Christ. And may that inspire in us a great passion uh, to obey Christ uh, and to go forth uh, on his mission. And even that we would see the uniqueness of the gift of gathering together for corporate worship. So we thank you for this time. Uh, we pray you bless worship as we go into worship. Praise in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen.